Chancellor and his able staff on whose shoulders the activity. Lord, we are gathered this afternoon to commemorate the day you called our former president, Professor John Evans Atta Mills, into your glory for the exemplary life you gave him. We therefore invite you to preside over our gathering this afternoon. Our chairman, Professor Joseph Gatiampia, and our guest, our guest of Anna, of Sabarin Makwesiata Lali. We pray that you guide our guest speaker, Professor Kwesi Botre, whom you have prepared to address your people. Let your heavenly wisdom, knowledge, to hear and learn from the words of wisdom. We therefore commence this function in the name of God the Father, God. Reverend Professor, thank you very much for the opening prayer. All our guests who have joined us this afternoon, but we now have the privilege of acknowledging all of you because a number of you are very familiar. And so if you're a family member, do pardon us that if we do not have give you the due acknowledgement, but for the guests who have joined us. He was an international advisory board member of Compare, a journal of comparison. Very much. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Senior Minister, the Regional Minister, Guest of Honor, Saberema Kwisiata II, Omahin of the Ugwa Traditional Area, Our speaker for today, Professor Chrissy Butri. Our colleagues from GEMPA, we salute you. Pro Vice Chancellor, Registrar, Provost Dean's Heads of Department, invited guests, the media, Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome all of you to the University of Cape Coast, popularly called the University of Competitive Choice. And for us to have this lecture, I'm ha happy that we are hosting this lecture here today. This is a lecture that we've been hosting with, co-hosting with, and collaborating with GIMPA. And when they hold it one year, we hold it the other year. This year is our turn to hold it, and we thank them for coming to be with us here. So I'm happy to be the host, and I accept to chair this function to its logical conclusion. I will, however, need your cooperation to enable me to do so, so that we comport ourselves and we we'll listen, we take notes, and we get their ideas from Professor Boutry, who will speak to us. And the topic is decided to speak on, which I believe is dear to his heart, and he will want to elaborate on it so we all get a good understanding of it, which will be in memory of uh, former president, the late Professor Atamels. He started the topic, ethicality democracy, and national development, the legacy of President Atamels. I believe that we'll all cooperate to listen to him and to take useful lessons home. For those, I believe that we are ready, I'm ready, our speaker is ready, and we'll have a good time. Thank you very much. Prof, thank you. And um, earlier available, we'll give them the due acknowledgement. Would you also just give a hand of applause to the regional minister, Mr. Kwame Duncan, who will give an honor who is gracing the occasion this afternoon with his and is in the person of Osabri Marcus. George will let me give a little bit of attention to him. Osabri Marcus, the second national accountant. ACCA. He's a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants. Thank you. Can I please stand on the protocol you established and add my voice to the welcome to all of you here this afternoon. We are gathered here to hear more about somebody whose character, whose behavior, and what he stood for has brought all of us here. The series of lectures that have been lined up in the past and in the years to come have become necessary because of what we believe this man, Professor John Evans Atabeos, stood for. My request is this, that after listening to what he stood for, we, when we go back, will try and emulate what he has left for us. When we were waiting for 
the commencement of this program. Professor Boche and the senior minister met in the room and it was a delight to see that even though politically they may be opposing each other, the warm, the reception was said that this should be what we should all be aiming at. Despite the fact that they are in the opposing political uh, parties, doesn't mean they are enemies. This is what we all want to aspire to and take home as a guide so that what is going on in this country, if you don't believe, belong to this party, you are not with us. This sort of, what is creeping into, into our society, let's all take a cue from this and let us see ourselves as Ghanaians aiming at one goal for the prosperity and the unity of this country. I'm just to make remarks, and these are the few remarks I want to make. And I hope that we'll all be attentive and listen to what we will be told and go home and do what we expect to do. Thank you and God bless. Attention to Professor Dora Francisca Edubwando, who is a member of the local organizer, distinguished invited guests. I'd like to take this opportunity to add my voice to the Vice Chancellor and welcome you. But I'd like to introduce a very special guest who is here this afternoon with us. Our special guest is a consultant, a politician, and a statesman. He was active as a consultant for international development organizations, including the World Bank and UNDP. He was a Minister of Finance and Economic Planning for four years from 2001 to 2005, and the Minister for Education and Sports from 2005 to 2006. He was instrumental in setting up the Methodist University College, Ghana, and he is currently serving as the senior minister in the Republic of Ghana. Today we are privileged to have our distinguished guests, Honorable Yao Safuma, with us. Shall we welcome him? <laughs> so we are grateful for honoring us with your presence. Thank you. Tanzania and the University of Ghana 
before he was appointed Minister of Finance in 1982. After he left office in 1995, our speaker went back to academia. He held appointments at the Center for International Development, CID, at Harvard, the Earth Institute of Columbia University, and the Fletcher School at Tufts University, where he was professor of practice in development economics. Our speaker was prominent in international development circles for well over two decades. He chaired the UN Secretary General's panel of eminent persons on the independent evaluation of the United Nations new agenda for the development of Africa in the 1990s and the Commonwealth Expert Group on Good Governance and the Elimination of Corruption in Economic Management. He has consulted widely for a number of important institutions, including the World Bank, the IMF, the UNDP, and African Development Bank. He is the immediate past chairman of the National Planning Commission and is currently the founder and executive chairman of the African Development Policy Initiative, ADPOI. Ladies and gentlemen, help me to welcome our distinguished speaker, Professor Kwesi Bochi. Thank you, Dora, for that introduction. May I please um, ask all of us to observe a minute's silence in memory of Professor Ivan Santamos. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Chairman, distinguished Vice Chancellor of the University, the Senior Minister, my friend, Osama Mafu. Distinguished colleagues, comrades, ladies and gentlemen, Nana, actually, what you didn't realize is that ministers of finance uh, belong to a club. Um, we respect one another, because we each know um, what that offers harbors. <laughs> I'm delighted to have been asked to deliver this year's and the sixth John Evans Atamel's commemorative lecture. Fifi, as most of us call him, was a classmate of mine at the University of Ghana Law School and a friend with whom, and uh, this is little known, I shared 
a common passion for field hockey. In my youth, when I played for, um, I played hockey for Cornerstones. I don't know how many of you remember uh, Cornerstones. And actually, Fifi was one of a few friends who continued to call me by my erstwhile Christian name, Eddie. Completely undeterred by my brilliant attempt at wiping out what I thought was a, a colonial into intrusion in my given name. Actually, when I went to the States to study, and this was in the uh, late 60s, the Black Panther movement was at its height in the United States. And I and a friend of mine who was from Kenya would go to you know, social gatherings with African-Americans, and each time they would ask, what's your name? Of course, we told them, Eddie Bochwe, and you know, John, some, somebody. But then we realized that they were in the process of indigenizing their names. So you ask them who they were, and you say, yeah, or somebody, and we say something. And each time we said, Eddie or John, they looked at us funny. One of them would say, Nigga, the name is Eddie. Yeah. So we kind of got tired of all this. And so I decided that I will um, drop the Eddie and just have my peace. Um, but Fifi never uh, recognized the change. Um, now, as I set out to sort of contemplate the contours of the subject that I had elected to speak on. It occurred to me that I might just pause and reflect on whether people generally would readily see this subject as a legitimate focus of his commemoration. Now, a quick thumbing through of the torrent of tributes that people paid him upon his sad and bewildering demise confirmed to me quickly that just about everybody saw him the same way I did. It was a gratifying and somewhat predictable affirmation. The most common and recurring theme in those tributes to him was his humility, his decency, qualities that are at variance with the popular perception of politics and politicians. Indeed, politics is a dirty game. It's a common saying that more than sums up this popular perception. Today, I'd like to explore with you what these qualities of decency and humility that everyone saw in President Atamils really mean and how they matter and are relevant in our national development 
and our nascent democracy. Indeed, this is a conversation that has assumed even greater poignancy and significance in the equally painful loss of our former Vice President, Bakwesi Imisa Arthur, whom Fifi appointed as the Governor of the Bank, and whom we are mourning as we speak. And about whom, just in case anybody missed it, the same virtues were widely recalled in teeming tributes. I speak advisedly about ethicality. Now, just in case any one of you might feel it is a little dense, ethicality, think of ethics, it is something that struggles the terrains of honesty, humility, and decency, and a concern for the moral quality of any cause of action we canvass as leaders and as politicians generally. Thus, taken in its broad sweep, ethicality does not simply mean being a nice person, being a nice guy. Indeed, President Mills himself spoke eloquently in a number of his um, state of nation addresses on the subject. In one, he pledged to always be guided by a principle he had long cherished, he said, to always try to make the right decision rather than a hasty and expedient one. The right decision. He spoke about his commitment to creating an atmosphere of inclusiveness, respect, and courtesy in our national discourse and debate, and I quote, and to doing away, he said, with the style of politics that, and I quote, mistook democratic transfer of power as an opportunity to wreak vengeance. He took a decisive stand and was determined to break the cycle of vengefulness and recriminations. That's so besets the nation and often sees businessmen, contractors driven to ruin. That sees even public servants on occasion more or less summarily dismissed for barely disguised political reasons. All of us behind a veil of profuse legalism. More importantly, it was his natural inclination to ethical principles 
That gave him the supreme courage to put the interests of the people, especially the middle to lower ranks of the civil service, above his personal popularity and that of the party he led by ordering the implementation of the single-spine pay policy. A policy that was adopted in the dying days of the Kufo administration, President Kufo's administration, in spite of the huge challenges it posed for the management of our wage bill, and for the nation's fiscal situation generally. I'm sure my good friend Osafo knows exactly what I mean. <laughs> Thus, ethicality connotes something deeper and has many dimensions which have been widely noted by researchers, academics, and analysts trust them over time. Some have even spoken of a code of ethics for politicians. Although I don't know that that's where we want to go. One can almost intuitively identify some of the components of ethicality that mark the man we are commemorating today. Those that readily come to mind include his integrity, his honesty and rectitude, his transparency and open-mindedness, his commitment to responsibility and accountability of public officials, his impartiality in the management of conflicts, disputes, allegations and counter-allegations among appointees and institutions. As I'm sure many of you who worked with President Mills would know. He vigorously encouraged whistleblowing as a powerful way of holding public officials and persons accountable, but also as a sign of his abiding ethicality. He would typically detain the whistleblower by having him or her wait in an adjoining room to his office, then invite the person or persons against whom the allegations had been made, and then have the whistleblower come out of his waiting place and repeat exactly, and I mean exactly, what he or she had come to report to him. He insisted that it be just the same thing the person said in the same language, preferably. Many an axe grinder turned whistle lower fell on this ethical soul and were often sent packing with rather stern admonitions from Fifi. Don't come here again. <laughs> President Mills understood that an important part of the job of shoring up the integrity of government 
and ensuring its accountability was also to curb the incidence of what I call the informal layers of power. People who hold no formal offices and thus cannot be held to account, but are known to actually wield enormous power and influence on policy making, including the allocation of and disbursement of resources, public resources, and even the communication of government policy. These informal layers of power are not unknown in well-established democracies where they create similar tensions. But there, they are restrained by more elaborate and effective controls and arguably even accountability. While there are clear rules that deal with what has been termed government ethics, with this particular focus on the regulation of conflicts of interest and whistleblowing in the holding to account of, public, of office holders, no such regulation is possible. nor is the establishment of standard criteria for individual responsibility possible with these behind the scenes power brokers or what I call the informal layers of power. Now, special mention must be made of President Mills's abhorrence of arrogance and hubris that is often associated with a pretense at omniscience, knowing everything, having all the answers and solutions, having all the brains a failing that sometimes leads to a parading of time-honored ideas and solutions as novelties and the work of genius. And above all, his disapproval of the art of manipulation, spin, and duplicity in the communication of government and even party positions to the citizenry and to the media alike. Just listen to him again in his 2010 State of the Nation address, and I quote, nobody has a monopoly of either vision or wisdom and we take honest criticism in good faith. These are virtues that are not exactly in abundant supply in our nation today, alas. They are virtues that obviously mean very little to autocratic governments, for obvious reasons. They don't need the people's consent to do anything. However, we must understand that they help to sustain the legitimacy of democratic governments. Moreover, as one analyst puts it, the permanent presence of an opposition force to which an opposition party is a necessary condition of the power of government. 
The idea is that not to press into consensus or silence the parties which do not belong to government after the last elections. The winners are winners because they are losers who recognize their defeat, but still continue to disagree. The idea is not for incumbent governments to bludgeon opposing political parties and civil society organizations into acquiescence through blackmail or threats of criminal investigation, prosecution or persecution. In, in, in Fifi's worldview, those who aim to stay in power, well, almost permanently, through these methods, cannot claim to be true Democrats. They have no place for ethicality in the conception of governance. All this is to say that President Mills was greatly concerned about the ethical principles that should regulate national office holders. And this because he understood that it had implications for the consolidation of our national democracy and our national development. Now, the basic tenet of so-called modernization theory that suggests a relationship between economic development and democracy is normally tested through cross-national or cross-national time series, if there are any economists here, global analysis, and although it is by no means universally agreed among scholars and researchers, there is a substantial body of literature that suggests there is some correlation between democracy and economic development. Although many places in the world that have seen the most phenomenal development have seen this happen under autocratic regimes. There are many policy issues of national development, including the challenges of fiscal consolidation, of taxation, public investment strategies, that need cross-partisan support, even where the incumbent party has the requisite parliamentary majority to adopt them. Investors, especially foreign ones, look at the buy-in of opposition parties to critical government policies in assessing country risk to long-term investment. Now, there were, these were the considerations that were on his mind when he spoke of putting an end. These were the considerations that were on President Mills' mind when he spoke of putting an end to the cycle of vengefulness and recriminations in political transitions in our country. There are, of course, um, criticisms of political ethicality, the quality we are touting as the essence of President Atamilis' legacy.
There are those among them, academics, analysts, and even practitioners alike, who believe that politics is a dirty business anyway, and that the talk of political ethics is almost a contradiction in terms, and it's unrealistic, and places needless constraints on politicians, especially those who operate in a representational capacity, and must sometimes take decisions and make judgments that are at variance with their own moral standards. Yet others object that political ethics focuses too much on particular policies and policy makers and politicians, thereby ignoring the cause of larger injustices in the society generally, such as poverty, inequality, which a powerful individual may not be able to do anything about by himself. But these criticisms don't really vitiate the fundamental perquisite of President Mills's ethicality, defined not as some moralizing code, but as a commitment to a set of principles that guide actions and policy choices that political office holders and leaders make. In his case, it included his commitment to the fiscal discipline and macroeconomic stability and employment generating growth, as well as the legacy projects that were undertaken under his leadership. Now, so far, we have spoken almost entirely about the relevance of Professor Mills's concern for decency and ethicality at the national level. At the, at the level of governance. But it has a place as well in the management of the party, of party management, of the party that he led to victory and housed in its current address. Indeed, the loss of ethicality had a lot to do with the party's defeat in 2016. In the work that I chaired, thanks to the uh, decision of the national executive to involve me in that important endeavor. We identified, and the party is aware of Thank you very much. I'm happy that today I invited speaker, Professor Kisiboche, has delivered eloquently for us the topic he has couched, ethicality, democracy, national development, the legacy of President Atta Mills. 
which is actually the source Ivan Atamel's commemorative lecture. I, I will now want to summarize what Professor Kusibuchi has said. If I do, I'll dilute what he has said, because then I'll take certain things out of it, which I believe shouldn't be. I believe that each and every one of us then has something to take away from this lecture. Oh. And I believe that there are issues that he's talking about. We've heard of those issues. He has eloquently told us about Professor Jonathan Nelson and what he stood for. And I believe that each and every one of us has something to take home, to ponder over. Today, I have made my work very easy because then you have paid attention and you have cooperated with me to share those functions to those end. I believe that the things that we have heard today will keep on ringing in our minds. And at the end of the day, we become better citizens, all of us, than what we are now. Thank you very much. God bless you. Prof, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we just want to remind you once again that this program is live on ATL FM, University of Cape Coast. We call on the chairman for the local organizing committee, Professor Peter Grant, to give the vote of thanks. Everybody who is gathered here and to all those listening to us out there because we could not all be contained at this very venue. But I cannot proceed further without highlighting some individuals who had played additional roles which has made our presence here possible. First and foremost, I would like to thank our guest of honor, Saberma Pesiata II. We thank you here as our guest of honor. I would also Accra Liaison Team uh, which helped in putting uh, this cannot end without my thanks to my provost, Professor Dora Francesca Edubwando, activities behind the scenes, and she never flagged. Go to the local organizing committee, were called at odd hours, and yet you managed to attend them willingly and ungrudgingly. My thanks will not be complete without thanking the Sandwich students who, though preparing feverishly for their quizzes and others and the upcoming exams, took time off lectures and grace days, who thronged this place and actually made it a befitting public of our president who has gone on to his eternal rest. A great testament to the fact that if you live a life <laughs> of this meeting, uh, current government officials present, the political parties in Ghana, the NPP, the NDC, PPP, PNC, CPP, NDP. I would respectfully request that this category would take leave of us first whilst we wait for them, and they would make their way to the Vice Chancellor's Lodge. Uh, the rest of us, other mortals, uh, receive our refreshment. Thank you. We pray that you lead all of us home safely. Lord, we thank you and we glorify your name. Thank you. God bless you.
I'm Henry Kukui from former MC in fact, man. Um, I think he was concise. He was uh, trying to mirror the life of uh, Professor Mills. And I happened to be the, the, I was the chief executive for his constituency. And he stood for integrity. He stood for he, he, well, what people term the father for all. And he thought that we should do our politics anew. And that's exactly the things that Kusiboche, Professor Kusiboche was talking about. That we've got to do things in such a way that they will not see politicians as people who do not uh, have integrity. We should not go the way that everybody goes and say that politics is dirty and all of that. I think uh, and the ethical issues that he was talking about is apt and it describes Professor Mills. Oh yes, I mean if you are in Ghana now and you see what is going on, they touted the Mahama government as corrupt, but now what, what are we seeing? What we're seeing is even worse than what we came to meet. And so if we are going to go down and then we point to the fact that, oh it happened last time and so people are going to do much more grievous things than what happened, then where are we going? And like he put it, that will be going deep, deep down the grave. And I think today's message is very good. I, I believe that all politicians will listen to it. And then we change our ways and do what Prof stood for, integrity. Mr. Mensa, uh, flag bearer hopeful of the National Democratic Congress, the former chief executive of the National Health Insurance Authority and the former member of parliament for the Dade Kutupon constituency. All right, thank you so much. What's your take on the whole lecture? I think that Professor Kusibotri nailed it in a very succinct and brief presentation. In short, he spoke about how our Ghanaian society appears to be breaking down. He spoke about the, the breakdown in moral leadership, a situation where Ghanaians are not seen first as Ghanaians before breaking up into other political parties. By seeing Ghanaians first as belonging to a political party and giving preference to one political party, a section of Ghanaians against uh, another. The breakdown in the public and civil service is a typical example where we have chief directors who are appointed who have no experience, no basis in the public and civil service, where the entire civil service, the ministries are occupied by individuals who have no locus within the civil service, and where the key functions of the civil service is assigned to individuals who have never worked in the civil and public service to the, to the frustration of the entire system. We have the heads of the public service and the civil service who have become appendages of government and have failed to exercise their authority in ensuring the independence and neutrality of the public and civil service. They have failed to ensure that government does the right thing. I think that the breakdown of moral leadership has descended to that level, to the extent that we now have a situation where government has extended its intolerance to even constitutional bodies. Constitutional bodies like the Electoral Commission, where the bar for instability has been lowered to the point that the Electoral Commissioner has been exited on uh, contrived charges, on the charges based on the political machinations, procurement has been named as the reason for exiting an electoral commissioner. Whereas we all know that when you look at the Auditor General's 
reports it is replete with procurement challenges at all levels we have situations where key and leading ministers of the current Anadu, president Anadu's government are alleged to be involved in several procurement uh, challenges and yet that is how we chose to exit the electoral commissioner it is even worse with an institution like the bank of ghana we saw what happened under professor mills where the governor had about two years to as it were complete his contract he was allowed to stay on to complete his contract in contrast we saw how the governor was exited we saw how the deputy governor was pushed out not even the deputy governor was spared i mean the level of intolerance the level of moral uh, uh, a breakdown in moral uh, leadership is so high that this country appears to be in real real challenge I'm sorry, I'm not commenting on that now. My comment is on the wrong manner in which the electoral commissioner was exited and the fact that government has succeeded in lowering the bar for causing instability even in constitutional bodies into the future. Thank you very much. Um, I didn't hear that in particular. Perhaps I'll look at what that means. Thank you very much. Well, I am Professor Peter Grant, the chairman of the LOC that organized this lecture. Well, as you noted, the lecture was very well attended. In actual fact, it went beyond our imaginations because, uh, like it or not, uh, some have still not gotten over the fact that this is a national event. So some seem to associate it more with one party than the other party. But we could see that the people who came cut across the political divide. So it shows clearly that people have come to accept this and it has come to stay. And we hope that we will be able to memorialize other leaders who have served the country and are gone. So that people will know that it is worth dying for your country. But specifically to the lecture, you know that the main key points were on the ethicality of the former president and the fact that he was a man of his word and he was a man whom nobody could taint with corruption. There was never at any part in his public history, public uh, life history as uh, somebody who worked for the tax agency as a lecturer, vice president and president, did anybody say he had corrupted himself in any manner. And he believed that once you are ethical, moral about your activities and you are also able to keep sight of the fact that this is a democratic dispensation, these two items will help build our nation. And you rightly remarked before you put me on about the statement made by the speaker that if you look at our body politic, it appears that we are still unable to get to the root of corruption and then extinguish it from our body politic. I'm reminded of one man who said that corruption is the glue that holds the Ghanaian society together. So he believes it is very difficult to get rid of corruption. And Professor Kwesi Boche noted that it appears on, an, uh, on a particular rotational basis, one corrupt group of individuals are replaced by another corrupt group of individuals. Now that is a strong indictment on us as a people. So we must do soul searching and make sure that we do not reward corrupt people or groups. So if during a particular uh, government's term of office, we can affirm that the government was corrupt, then we should not reward them by voting them back into power. So unless we, the citizenry, decide to take over the reins of government by ensuring that we vote for people and groups that we can vouch for, then we will never be successful in removing corruption. It will just be another wishful thinking and we will never be able to do so. But I believe that the good people of Ghana will come to a point where we will form what we call the critical mass and we will be able to uproot corruption totally and we will make corruption a very, you know, uh, unpalatable thing for any person 
or group of people and we shall never reward corruption until we do that then we will never move anywhere but if we are able to do so then we will be able to save a lot of money for our own national development and it also behoves on officers who put themselves out to lead us also to be people who are ethically and morally upright and would not soil themselves with any form of corruption. Well